Here. Okay. Anyways. So I hope uh, I didn't overstate the case. You can see that that was incredibly interesting and also that, that uh, Dr. Boleyn is a great speaker. So that was fabulous. Thank you so much. So now we're going to have an invited discussant, Eric Furtick, who is an assistant professor of clinical psychology and psychiatry at Columbia. He's also a research scientist at the uh, New York State Psychiatric Institute, and he's faculty at the Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. So you can already hear from his, you know, sort of multiple positions that he's uh, in a similar vein as, as Heather Berlin, sort of doing both clinical psychodynamic work and also neurobiologically informed research. Uh, he got his PhD from Adelphi, and he also received a certificate in psychoanalysis from Columbia, and he was also an NIMH research fellow. And I can personally vouch for the fact that he'll probably be great to listen to because I heard him do a demonstration of working psychoanalytically with a borderline patient at a conference at Mount Sinai last summer. So if I didn't need further analysis, I would think about calling Eric because he seemed like such a great clinician. So I'm looking forward to hearing him speak. Thank you. Come on up. Um, yeah, we, so though we come from different um, trainings and traditions, we, we have kind of uh, both worked on a similar clinical problems. And I think that as uh, Dr. Zahner was alluding to, that this might be reflective of a newer generation of psychoanalysts and cognitive neuroscientists who can, um, who can kind of work together and um, join minds. Uh, so let me just um, shift to uh, the first thing I wanted to discuss, which is the state of the science. I can't really add too much to, to Dr. Berlin's really comprehensive presentation, but I wanted to just try to synthesize it in a couple points that I thought um, some might be obvious, but I think they can't be underscored enough. One is that unconscious processes can be studied in the psychology laboratory. This, um, this began with the cognitive revolution in, in cognitive psychology, which is now extended into neuroscience. Um, and so. Um, I think psychoanalysts should be aware that or unconscious processes aren't just in the consulting room. They're not just harnessed in the consulting room. They can't just be studied in the consulting room. Um, so now there's, there's really literally thousands of psychological studies documenting various forms of unconscious processes. Um, and many of them uh, had now have a lot of face validity with some of the things that we observe clinically. Um, and I think that's an exciting development. Secondly, um, I think this is another point worth underscoring, there is no singular unconscious. There are unconscious processes that um, have various functions and forms and purposes and um, manifest in various different ways. Um, so um, I think this uh, is something that psychoanalysts are, are, need to get, a, get away from a little bit in, in talking about the unconscious. It's really more which unconscious process is active at this time under, under what conditions and why. Um, Secondly, or thirdly, I'm sorry, uh, I think um, Dr. Berlin's presentation really strongly shows that neural data can contribute to our understanding of unconscious processes. Um, for a couple of kind of obvious things, one is that they're, they're not easily um, subject to what psychologists call demand characteristics or situational factors, um, and they're not easily manipulated consciously, so they can provide an index of, of uh, behavioral and neural activity that, um, that is genuinely unconscious if the person doesn't realize they're happening. Um, but, you know, neural information isn't the only kind of information that, that we can be, use in this, be used in this way, but I think it's a crucial one. Um, and then, finally, there's no singular neural correlate of consciousness. Um, these are often distributed processes that involve communication and coordination of different brain regions. And often there are many of the same brain regions that are involved when we're consciously processing information. It's, what might be different is more the quality of the communication among brain regions. I think that Dr. Berlin um, emphasized that point as well. Um, so I just wanted to now try to link these concepts a little bit more strongly with where we are in, in um, psychoanalysis. Can we integrate, are we in a position now where we can integrate psychoanalytic and cognitive neuroscience models of unconscious processes and then more generally of, of the mind? Um, so think, for example, of the kind of unconscious processes that are familiar to probably most of us, at least to me, in, in our day-to-day -day work with patients. Uh, 
So for example, consider an alisand who's unwittingly competitive and passive aggressive with the boss due to perhaps an unresolved Oedipal or competitive conflict. In analysis, such competitive, competitiveness may eventually manifest as the patient reading up on his or her diagnosis and questioning and challenging the analyst about their expertise and, and whether they've, they, they truly you know, are treating the, the patient um, ad ad adequately. Or think of a patient with borderline personality with a history of childhood abuse and neglect who consciously yearns for a loving relationship but repeatedly, unintentionally chooses abusive, neglectful romantic partners due to the largely unconscious assumption that, that, they're, that this person's fundamentally bad and doesn't really deserve a good relationship. And finally, think of a patient who, for example, doesn't pay uh, their bill on time, which upon exploration leads to the um, a, growing awareness of a wish that they feel ready to end their analysis, and they, but they fear that the analysts will retaliate against them if they express that directly. These are the kinds of unconscious processes that, that um, clinicians deal with, but that aren't that well captured yet in the lab, despite a lot of advances. Um, so I think our challenge is to, um, to uh, try to Bridge, bridge these kinds of processes more closely with uh, laboratory science that Dr. Berlin mentioned. Uh, there's a, a quote that I found from Erdeli. Um, he says, in the 19th century, there was the birth not just of one uh, scientific psychology, but two, the first in Vienna with Freud and the second in Leipzig with uh, Wilhelm Wundt, who is the father of um, experimental psychology. And um, these two traditions have you know, for the most part, remain relatively independent and developed relatively independently. And this is the couch that you saw already where Freud kind of got the data for his theories of the unconscious. And this is Wilhelm Wundt with his colleagues in the first psychology laboratory, right at really around the same time, not too far geographically from where Freud was developing psychoanalysis. Um, so these two traditions have kind of developed um, qualitatively different and quantitatively different ideas of what's, wh what the unconscious processes are, are doing and what they're for. Uh, I just tried to uh, kind of summarize in this table. Um, so if psychoanal the, the psychoanalytic unconscious is, um, or the psychoanalytic unconscious processes, I have to correct myself even, um, are often motivated, emotional, hot in, in terms of uh, uh, wishes and, and drives. They're often seen as uh, maladaptive. They get patients into trouble. Um, and they were developed um, uh, on patients with, with some form of psychopathology. And the uh, psychodynamic unconscious processes are dynamic. They, they involve competing motives and wishes that don't reconcile and that lead to strategies to try to, like, to, to, to reach compromises that um, at least help in the short run but don't always help in the long run. And finally, it's ideographic. That is, it's, it's developed in, in, in uh, a case-by-case -case basis often, um, and it's very individual, individualized and specific to that person's dynamics. Um, the cognitive unconscious, um, at least up until recently, has been quite different. It's, it has been relatively non-emotional, cold, and, and seen as rational. Um, and uh, as a corollary, as Dr. Berlin mentioned, it's adaptive for complex information at times. Um, it's of, often developed on normal volunteers, um, with some exceptions being, I guess, neurology patients who have um, lesions and things like that. Um, it, it's influenced by emo evolutionary pressures. So for, I'm thinking of Ledoux's work where he talks about um, kind of a fast track to, to, uh, to processing fear that bypasses conscious awareness and a slow track which involves more deliberative uh, processes to downregulate and deal with external pressures stimulating a fear response. And um, it's relatively static and automatic. That is, there's not much discussion of competing motivations and compromises and conflicting emotions that have to be reckon, uh, reckoned with. Um, and finally, it's, it's often nomothetic. These are this, most of the studies that um, Dr. Berlin mentioned are using groups of people compared to one another and looking at averages and group means rather than individual responses. Um, so uh, I think that Dr. Berlin's talk actually showed that we've, there's been some progress in, in, in kind of reconciling some of these differences. One, I think um, cognitive neuroscientists are, use, are, are really starting to take much more seriously motivated processes, emotional processes, um, and weaving them into their paradigms by using emotionally, um, uh, emotionally valenced stimuli, for example, or using autobiographical memories and, and things like that. And um, I think that has really um, excited a lot of people.
Um, on the other hand, I think um, psychoanalysts have become more aware of the potential adaptive nature of unconscious processes. Um, and for example, as a clinician, I often think if, even if someone's doing something just seemingly self-destructive or counterproductive, it, I, I try to think of well, what purpose does it serve or in what context would it be adaptive for them to do this? And that often helps you to figure out um, you know, how to intervene where in, in, a, in, a, in kind of an empathic way because in a certain context, what they are doing often made sense, but just not anymore. Um, also, you, you, we're seeing more and more studies comparing psychiatric and neurological populations to healthy control, so I think that there's a lot of um, progress being made there, so that, and I think both inform each other. So um, by having um, knowledge of what happens in relatively healthy individuals, we can be more clear what's going awry in pe people with psychopathology, and by seeing what goes awry, we can get a clear understanding of the mechanisms in um, relatively healthy individuals. Um, in this area, there's been a little bit of work, but um, I think that this is an area that's ripe for um, integration, especially if we reconceptualize drives in terms of their derivatives, which are you know emotional and motivational states. Um, it, sorry, the last couple I think um, we need a little bit more work on. Um, and so for example, are there laboratory procedures where we can kind of induce for the purposes of imaging uh, kind of a, 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 a conflicted emotional state and um, look at what the neural mechanisms of maintaining that supposed compromise formation are. Um, that's, I think, for future work. And also the ideographic nomothetic. I think we can start weaving in uh, and integrating paradigms where we look at both group processes, but then individualized processes. For, so for example, uh, th there are now kind of experimental transference uh, paradigms that are individualized to each person but that tap common processes. So you can look at both individual responses to transference evocation um, and to group responses to, to, the, to that same process. Um, I wanted to say a, a little bit about some, put this a little, a little bit in a historical context. Um, I, I, in um, reading Dr. Uh, Berlin's PowerPoint, I, I thought of a paper by Robert Bornstein in 2005 he called, it, he called it reconnecting psychoanalysis to mainstream psychology. I think it's relevant to cognitive neuroscience as well. He described a three-step process where a lot of psychoanalytic concepts have been co-opted um, by academic psychology and cognitive psychology um, and then rediscovered. And he actually su suggests that this is a, maybe for many uh, scientists an unconscious process where they were exposed to some psychoanalytic ideas at some point, which they later kind of disavowed or repressed in some way. But found its way back into, in, in, with a new name into their work. Um, so for example, he suggests some processes like primary process thought um, is reconceptualized as a spreading activation, object representations as person schemas, uh, preconscious processing as pre-attentive processing, parapraxies as retrieval errors, abreaction as reintegration, Repetition compulsions as nuclear scripts that keep replaying, ego as a central executive, and ego defenses as defensive attribution. So this is an example of the, the, the column on the right are mainstream academic psychologists um, who are studying these kinds of things in um, experimental settings and who um, often in their papers never reference any psychoanalytic concept. Um, so he says that that, that first step is um, this unconscious co-opting of an oper operationalization of a psychoanalytic concept. The second step is constructing an empirical base. So once you have the, the measure, you start doing research on it. And um, I call this the return of the repressed. At a certain point, these people realize, oh my gosh, this is a lot like what Freud was talking about 100 years ago. Um, and um, then they emphasize the, start emphasizing some of the parallels between what they're doing and what, what Freud uh, was talking about. And this seems quite amazing. Um, and you know, finally, there's a um, reintegration. But at this point, the, new, the concept has kind of been totally co-opted by the new discipline, and it has a new name. Um, so I think um, Dr. Berlin's pre presentation represents kind of a new attitude where cognitive neuroscientists and psychoanalysts can, can kind of speak, a, 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 or try to speak a common language and use each other's ideas uh, more consciously. And um, uh, so I... Um, just wanted to, to end on how we, how we might think about integrating this kind of research into a broader psychoanalytic research approach. And I, I think of three pillars of psychoanalytic research that are kind of equal in, in, in importance. 
One is the experimental psychopathology work that includes neuroimaging studies, but also just laboratory studies of cognition, emotion, and social behavior, and how those differ between patients and controls, and, and what are the mechanisms that are going awry um, in, in patients versus controls. Second is personality and social psychology, and, and with this I include um, kind of um, assessments of phenomenology and symptoms, um, which um, can't always be readily captured in laboratory settings or, or, or um, in um, self-report measures and things like that. And there are examples of these measures now that really do tap very nicely into uh, psychoanalytic constructs like object relations, defensive organization, personality organization. Uh, Drew Weston and Jonathan Shedler have a swap, swap assessment which kind of harnesses the clinical inference of the clinician in a, in, a, in a psychometrically reliable way so that we can really track changes and, and, and look at um, psychoanalytic oriented diagnoses. Um, in addition, the Cornell group has, has, a, has developed a structured interview for the assessment of personality organization that is, a, that is modeled off Kernberg's structural interview, but it's now semi-structured so that it's reliable and is valid with other independent indices and real life behavior. So we need to develop these kinds of measures as well. And then we need to finally link up with psychotherapy researchers and do randomized clinical trials, um, process studies, and look at mechanisms of change. Um, so in some psychoanalysis, I think, is starting to do this, but they need to, we need to do more moving from the armchair sidelines to the scientific front lines. We need to reciprocate the efforts of people like Dr. Berlin by um, bringing forth our own measures and our own methods and our own research um, to uh, join forces. We need to develop reliable and valid measures of the phenomena we treat. Um, we need to articulate the principles of our treatments in a clear way so they can be reliably administered in psychotherapy research. And we need to integrate neuroscience paradigms into treatment and experimental psychopathology studies, such as clinical trials and, and um, in social cognitive neuroscience um, uh, method programs of research that look at psychopathology. This seems like a tall order, but people are doing it. Um, we're doing it with borderline personality uh, at, at Columbia. They're doing it, some of that work at Cornell. Uh, and the Psychoanalytic Center at Columbia is doing that with, with um, psychoanalysis proper. So. Um, uh, I think what we just need is, is a little bit more effort in, this, in those regards. We obviously need funding, and we need um, you know, to, to nurture uh, a generation of people who are able to integrate these two things, which I think this talk illustrates is possible as well. So those are my comments. Hopefully that stimulates some discussion. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Psychoanalysis, and, and he told me that there was a lot of resistance from um, analysts because, uh, you know, which, which makes sense. We're doing therapy with each person is an individual, and you can't put them all together like we do in empirical studies and say, okay, this is a group of, you know, we have 10 such and such, and we want to compare them to 10 healthy controls because each individual person is unique and has their own unique story. And so he said that there was resistance um, in the, in the, from analysts to um, expose this, their, their, their therapy to empirical research. Um, but, but he thought it was a shame and that there should be more motivation in which to, to do so. So, and, and, and on, on Monday, I, ju I just gave a talk up at Harvard and one of the questions in the audience was, well, um, what's going on in the neural basis in therapy? How does it work? Um, and, you know, I, <laughs> I said, really, we don't know. And, but we're trying to figure it out. So I do think that you need efforts from both sides, from both, both the neuroscientists and cognitive scientists and from the analytic community to say, how can we try to empirically measure this and test it? And it's true, some work is being done now in borderline personality disorder. There's some imaging studies that are being done pre and post. Um, it's more of a cognitive behavioral therapy, the DBT, to say, well, what's going on in the brain before they engage in this sort of kind of a talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and what goes on in the brain after? Um, 
And we should start looking at you know, psycho, psychotherapy in that way. Can we look at, can we do imaging before someone engages in psychotherapy and then 10 years later? I mean, the temporal issue is a problem as well. We don't, can't control it in the lab, but we, at least from the, other, from the other side of the fence, from the psychoanalytic community, start thinking about developing measures or ways to, to test this, publishing um, papers and trying to understand in terms of how is the therapy working. We want to at least understand it at the neural level. And I think we do really need to work together. So, yeah. happy to take questions. So, thanks for both the, the talk and the discussion. And so, we'll just open it up for questions. Thank you. That was, it was very interesting. Uh, I have two comments. One, I think we really have to be careful about talking about unconscious and dynamic unconscious. <coughs> yeah. Well, the unconscious is, the dynamic unconscious is a psychoanalytic concept. And I, I, I think it gets so confused, I think we should really drop the whole idea of the use of the word unconscious when we're talking about phenomenological stuff and talk about out of awareness. Well, that's my opinion, but I think it is confusing. Right the other thing is that you should get in contact with Dr. Berlin with, some, I forget his name, at Cornell, who was using this proof test to bring about this dissociative uh, a phenomenon with hypnosis, and then doing the the, uh, scan, the studies, you know, the scanning studies, the uh, MRI, functional MRI, and it's pure, I think it's in the anterior cingulate gyrus where this happens. And of course, the the neurological, not the neural, but the neurological version of that is anosognosia, pronounce it correctly, uh, which is a denial uh, brought about through a, a, a stroke or some kind of a destruction or a compromising of that, that area of the brain. I think it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing as you're talking about in terms of dissociation at the, at the psychological level. I myself think they're entirely separate phenomena, but it is interesting the parallelism. I, just wanted to, I, I can't remember his name, I, I forget his name, but I'm sure you could. Huh? I think yes, yes, yes. It would really be interesting for you to talk to. Him. Maybe you already know, I don't know. I think he's talking about Amir Ross. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so two things. The first point about, um, I agree, confabulating between the unconscious and the dynamic unconscious. So typically in, in um, cognitive psych studies and neuroscience studies, they would just look at what you described as the, the cognitive unconscious and sort of this just um, very unemotional unconscious. And just sort of, and do you see things and do you not see it? How can we measure that? And doing some finding studies. And so um, what I call the sort of dynamic unconscious is this more motivated, more um, complex, this dynamic, rather than just you know seeing a stimuli and not seeing it. So I guess that is a good way to differentiate the sort of point, the cognitive unconscious and then this psychodynamic unconscious, which is more motivated and emotive. Um, in terms of the anterior cingulate, from what we know from just imaging studies with healthy control, it has to do with um, conflict, and so it makes sense that the street pass would be affected. But this, interestingly, this is the part of the brain, the anterior cingulate, cingulate Brahman area 25, is where we um, implant electrodes for treatment for treatment resistant depression. And we're not quite sure how it works, just like ECT kind of work, we're not sure how. This is more like a targeted ECT, so people have been depressed 20 years, they've tried everything, nothing works. They're desperate, they're suicidal. The same thing with obsessive compulsive disorder, although we target slightly different area. But we target that specific area, anterior cingulate, Brahman area 25, and it seems to work. And people have been depressed for years in the operating room. We'll start laughing, smiling, getting a good videotape of this. And they'll be laughing as soon as we turn off the electrodes. They don't know when they're being turned on or off. They'll just stop laughing and they won't be happy anymore. So it's this amazing um, area of the brain, but it is involved in, in I think, and even in healthy controls and truth tasks and conflict um, resolution. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you refer to uh, you know information networks like the internet, and uh, one thing that uh, communication networks intend to is information integrity. I didn't hear any mention of that uh, in your talk in relation to the brain. Uh, this is important in forensic applications, uh, for example, you know, retrieving uh, Are there mechanisms in the brain for retaining information integrity? Do you know anything? Well, if you talk about information integrity, I mean, I'm thinking about the, you're thinking about structurally, and if the, the neurons and the connections are intact, 
to be able to communicate the information. Because the way we look at information theory, it's just these transistors. It's just on off. Bits of information. That's how it's looked at. Bits of information. So if you're saying that the bit of information is um, unable to transmit, or it, like when you think about degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, where the actual structure is starting to disintegrate, you're having lack of communication and lack of integration of information just because they're structurally unable to communicate. No, I meant the information is correct or incorrect. Oh, incorrect, correct or incorrect. Well, in information theory, there's no such thing as correct or incorrect. It's just on-off. And it's, what they look at, it's a lot of mathematical formulas, but it's what the system has above and beyond its single part. So if you had two things that were just operating entirely, like the cerebellum, the cerebellum in the back of our brain, it's like a little brain, has just as many neurons and cerebral cortex, very complex, but we're not conscious of it. Or in our gut, there's neurons in there, um, a whole bunch of neurons. Sometimes you get that gut feeling, but we're not conscious of what's going on in our gut. It's the same kinds of neurons, but why aren't we conscious? Same thing with the cerebellum. The way it's structured, it's in parallel. So you have all these bits of information going on. Okay, maybe if you remove your cerebellum, you won't be a good dancer, and you can't do really complex physical things, you'll still be conscious. And the thing is that it's not integrated information. Um, it's not above and beyond just, it, they can be on, off, on, off. This one can be on or off, and it's not going to affect the one next to it, whether that's on or off. Where it's integrated, the fact that this is on is going to affect a bunch of other things, and it's all inter integrated, and that's a sort of difference. So there's no such thing as good or bad. It's just either integrated or not. If, if, you're, if you're really interested, I would suggest reading stuff by Giulio Tononi, because he would be much better able to explain it to me. It's his theory, it's quite complex, but it's, it's devoid of value. There's no right or wrong. Animals, and I think some have consciousness and even reasoning, and so many have instincts, like see, like arms. But and then you have information bits, and when you did 70 mill like milliseconds, what, what goes to the brain? Is it 50 and 70 and below that? Not. But the difference, I think, with consciousness is that you get um, emotions and reasoning, and that leads to creativity. And I can't see the internet having emotions, and, and, and they have reasoning in. in by this information coming to a degree. The whole state is on thermostat. That's the temperature every degree may go. It has to be a whole degree. Um, but it's not the same thing. In the internet is a huge thermostat of information, but it doesn't have emotions and reason, and therefore can't have creativity, and therefore doesn't have consciousness the way I think mammals have. Well, in order, I mean, I agree that emotion and, 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 and um, creativity and reasoning are very important um, constructs. But we don't necessarily need them to have just straightforward first-person subjective awareness. So, for instance, there's people who have their amygdala knocked out. There's people who have calcified amygdala, which is sort of emotion center of the brain, or certain prefrontal lesions where they lack kind of emotional processing. They're still conscious. Um, you know, experiencing the color red, just your subjective experience of red, will occur the void of emotion, and that brings in the question, you know, how much of the brain do you need? Do you need the image? Do you need, do you, do you need reasoning to really have the color red? Um, so I think for that baseline, um, first person subjective experience that you don't necessarily need to have emotion or, or reasoning to have subjective experiences, what they call them as quality. Now your experience of red will be will be modulated via your emotions. So, you know, emotions are going, and there's this thing called qualia space where people, this, in this information theory, where the shape of this qualia space will be different depending on their inputs like emotion and rationale. But the experience itself, you, it's not that you're gonna in one case be conscious, in one case not because you don't have emotion. And we know this again from great Asian patients and, and people with different psychiatric illnesses who are very hypo-emotional and lack affect, they're still conscious. I um, 
conscious or pre-conscious, no longer were uh, quasi-structures of the mind. Uh, and uh, the dynamic unconscious uh, it became very central. Uh, there are many other things that are not in the dynamic unconscious uh, or have that quality, like what regulates our uh, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, secretion of gastric juices. None of these ever become conscious. It's the dynamic conscious is potentially uh, able to become conscious. And it is rendered, as you made very clear, unconscious by some activity of the brain. But um, uh, the, um, uh, the nature of what we're dealing with is, uh, well, illustrating what we think, or at least it's touched on by a question I had in your work. Because almost all of your experimental work is related to presenting a subject with a perception and a task that's imposed from without. Have you any um, sense of there being any difference between that kind of setting and something the individual doesn't have imposed from without, but say a wish? an impulse, that he himself or she herself has the need to suppress, repress, render unconscious, and of course there it's not necessarily going to remain in that, uh, because one of the things that happens is that there will be a symptom of that. Uh, is there a distinction between those states? <coughs> Imposed from without as a task, understood cognitively, with a goal. You know, with one of the experiments you mentioned, uh, financial reward. Uh, is that to be equated with something, if we go back to one of the earliest cases, with Anna O, not even for its patient, but um, the um, the wish not to look after her father and his enemies, but to go dancing next door when she heard music. And every time she heard music, she began to call him. her father to call him. So uh, is there a distinction there that should be drawn and clarified? So I think that's a really good question. Um, one problem is that when we're trying to look at these things in the lab empirically, it's very difficult to you know, sit there in the lab and say, okay, let's just wait until you have an impulse and then we'll try to measure it. Or you know, in a scanner, for that matter, where it costs you know, close to $600 an hour, above that, an hour, you know, sit there in the scanner and wait for an impulse. That you know, becomes very difficult. I mean, there's this problem with this ecological validity of some of it, and this is a general problem in all you know, psychological studies. When you do something in the lab, it's an artificial experience. However, it's meant to be so, where you um, exclude compounds and try to really zone in in one particular um, phenomena and measure it. So yes, it is artificial. However, there are ways in which we can sort of get around that. Now, for instance, in the Libet study, which I didn't really talk about in detail, but he recorded action potentials um, for people who, who were basically just looking at this hand of a clock going around. And he just said, um, whenever you have the impulse to press this button, you can do it whenever you want. Just, you can sit there, you don't have to press it. Whenever you feel like pressing the button, press it. And just remember on the clock where that, that, that hand was. So he knows the moment that they decided to press the button. Um, so in that case, you know, it's just sort of not, the only thing they have is just to press a button whenever they feel like it. So in the sense, it's whenever they feel this internal motivation to press it. You know, then they do, and then he measured the, the action potential, which comes online about, um, I think it's 500 milliseconds before they actually said, oh, now I've decided to do that. But that's sort of one example. Um, and the other is that many, much of the work that I do actually looks at people with impulse control disorders, like pathological gambling, um, 
to people who have um, certain aspects of borderline personality disorder, where they're very impulsive. So they have these impulse control disorders in their everyday life. We take them in the lab, we try to measure. What's their sensitivity to reward and punishment? Can they withhold responding? You know, we give them a small reward now or a large reward later. It's your choice. Can they withhold? And actually what's really interesting is one of the greatest correlates of, um, of SAT scores later in life for children is if you give them this task um, where they have to withhold responding. You can either have you know, one marshmallow now or you can wait and have three marshmallows later. Well, how they perform on that task is one of the highest correlates of later on SAT scores. So there's something about this ability to inhibit. Now some people say, because humans have um, a larger percent of prefrontal cortex than any other species in terms of percentage of, to the rest of the brain. And one idea is that humans, which makes them so slightly different from other um, mammals, is that they have this ability to inhibit these component responses. So you know, an animal out in the wild, and they see something they want to rape or whatever, they're not going to say, you know, well, moral judgments and values, and there's future consequences, and when we think about that, they just act, sort of. And we have this ability to, to inhibit, and this might also give us the ability to come up with you know, language and writing and be able to not, okay, I want to eat now, I want to have sex, I want to, you know, all these innate drives, I can withhold that for something larger, for I want to write a book, you know, these, and this maybe creates these large-scale democracies, and all these things that we have, these structures, as humans, because we can inhibit these innate impulses, whereas other species might not be able to as much. And one, one theory of consciousness is that it's called free want. So you have this, this the, what consciousness is there for is you have all these drives and desires and it's there to say, wait, hold on a second. Um, I don't want to do that proponent response. But what we can do is take people with impulse control disorders or with brain lesions, like prefrontal cortex lesions we do studies with, or subcortical lesions, amygdala lesions, and test them in the lab to try to understand this phenomena at the basic scientific level. And so, so there's always going to be that gap between ecological validity and what we do in the lab. But we try our best to, to come up with really good paradigms to get at these phenomena, you know, other than just sitting in the lab waiting for someone to feel, you know, an impulse. So, but I, you know, I definitely take that point. It's a very valid point. Um, in terms of uh, the example we just gave uh, of the ability to repress. Uh, an activity and it's uh, postponing, say, a, a certain little work. Um, one of the, the questions that certainly comes to the mind of many neurologists is that the human brain's evolution began millions and millions of years ago uh, at a point where possibly something such as repression is more about a mother not leaving her child in the wild where an animal might prefer to eat it. And so the repression of that behavior is then what we inherited and uh, utilize from time to time to stay vulnerable. But that, uh, in effect, many of the uh, utilizations of unconscious processes uh, are, in fact, evolutionary and then have their uh, effects still with us to a certain degree, which may be difficult to test in the laboratory. I think that very, I mean, it makes sense even just today. Today's the evolutionary adaptive to not, uh, okay, so you're having a major anxiety problem or very emotional. If you sit there and freeze, or, or, or don't you know, just think about it constantly, and let it, you know, you're going to get eaten or by a lion or whatever the next negative threat is going to be. So evolutionarily speaking, it makes sense to somehow have a ne mechanism in the brain that can push this this emotion or this anxiety or this memory of something bad happening aside, so that you can adaptively function in the in, in the wild. It's like it, it, and you see this with patients. I mean, it's it's definitely maladaptive to their social function, to their everyday functioning. They, some of them can't work, I mean, and we have even gamblers, and they're going, and going, they're losing their money, they're losing their house, they're losing their family. They, um, it's definitely adaptive to come to be able to suppress these things, and even in healthy, in healthy people, it's adaptive. Suppression, repression, these are not maladaptive processes. That's, they're, they're adaptive defense mechanisms until, I think, at some point, they go awry. And, and um, when you're over-repressing and over-suppressing, at some point, it becomes maladaptive. But, I mean, I can definitely see clear, you know, evolutionarily speaking, reasons for why these processes occur. Any questions in the back there? Sorry, what have you been talking about? Could you comment on the question of the human will? You had something uh, inserted in your, in your presentation that you took it out. 
but the gap between the subjective experience and having a whim, um, it seems like a human whim could be an illusion um, which we have based on our collective need. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so I did a lot of work on this. I'm very interested in this idea of free will. Um, and recently, this summer, was at a, we had about a one week um, summer seminar and discussion on free will in Switzerland. And um, basically, as far as we know, in terms of our, in terms of cognitive neuroscience, it, it is an illusion to some extent. We only become conscious of the fact that we want to make a decision or we're making a movement. Um, after the fact, the brain already decides. And well, there's two points here. One is, will it really make a difference in terms of how you behave? If I tell you right now, you know what, your, your sensation of uh, voluntary control and volition is just an illusion. Okay, that's fine. But you're still going to sort of behave as if you normally are. I mean, it's not really going to change that feeling. It's not going to really change your behavior that much fundamentally. It seems to be very adaptive to have this sensation of I voluntarily have done that. I mean, your brain is doing it, but the conscious sensation, it's just another person. The, the feeling of agency, I did this versus the other person did it, is just another cognitive concept. And there's studies, especially I would suggest reading um, a book by Dan Wegner, and he does great experiences up at Harvard called The Illusion of Free Will, Illusion of Conscious Will. And you can manipulate that sense of agency. So for example, if simply I go on, turn on the light, and then the light, the light switch, the light goes on, I think, okay, I did that. Now let's say I turn the light and the light doesn't go on. And then maybe five minutes later it turns on. I'm going to think, now you're playing, you play with these technical delays, and you think, you know what, did I do that? This idea of agency. Or there are people when, you know, someone comes behind them and moves their arms, which is gesticulates, and if they do it in sync with the person, at some point, the person feels that they're actually controlling the arms. Like if the person moves the arms according to how the person is speaking, then then they play with temporal delay. If they do the arms like within a certain amount of delay after the fact, then the person doesn't feel like they have control. So you can manipulate it. It's just another cognitive, um, capacity that can be manipulated and I think it's adapted in some sense to feel like I'm doing this versus the other and to have a distinction between self and other but as far as we can see in terms of my neuroscientific studies the brain sort of makes up its mind first and then we become conscious of few other milliseconds after the fact yeah it's very controversial I mean people go crazy over this because our whole sense of being is about I have the free will to do such and such so but I, it doesn't take away from personal responsibility. That's another issue. <laughs> yeah, that's another topic. It doesn't take away from that, I don't think. So, so I thought yeah. I'd take a question from the back and it turns out that that's me. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if it's so much a, a question, but just sort of thinking about if either of you guys have a, a response to this. So I think that one of the important things that you were covering in your talk is the idea that there are all of these um, interacting modules or coalitions of neurons you know, that are moderating, responding to external stimuli, mo monitoring internal needs, correlating that with memory, you know, reward and punishment, episodic memory, and so on. And all of these networks are kind of talking to each other. And on the one hand, there's the idea that when a, a certain group of them reaches some kind of threshold, then you can become aware of something. Um, and so that has to do partly with the question of what is the function of awareness in the psychotherapeutic process? Because it seems like it's a very important aspect of it. Um, and it, it's an awareness that has to do with feeling something and not just being intellectually aware, because I think that that's one of the implications of one of your studies that's very, very important, is that those people, when they were not in the traumatic identity state, they're hearing the stimulus. It's the same thing in a way as me as a therapist sort of offering a kind of intellectualized comment to a patient that actually is true. It relates to the real content of what they're going through, but they can hear it and they can sort of slough it off or it doesn't sort of penetrate the way being in, other, in another kind of awareness really facilitates change. Um, so I was sort of thinking along those lines to see if you guys had any further things you wanted to say about that. And then also it occurred to me that sometimes I feel like when I'm sitting with a patient, I can see something or I feel something is going on in them that they're not aware of at the moment. And that seems to me to be a little bit like splitting, like there's some module, like clearly they're angry, they have some expression of anger on their face, but they're not talking about it. 
And if I have the courage to bring their attention to it, something new can happen once they become aware of it. It's as if different modules then can start to integrate with each other in that space of awareness. On the other hand, sometimes there's stuff going on, and it might be more often with a patient, where something is going on in them that I can't even detect myself. We have to sort of work it through in some kind of pattern of behavior or associations or whatever. And I'm wondering whether in the one case, that's the first case is a little bit more like splitting, where there's really active evidence of different modules being activated at the same time. And then on the other hand, it's more about repression, that there's something that's so thoroughly defended against that it's only leaking out in little bits. So those, neither of those are really specific questions, but I'm wondering if either of you have any further comments on either of those topics. So my thoughts on this, and some of it, I mean, a lot of it is conjecture, but from what I know about the brain and, and, and my studies on consciousness, is that there are three different things that are going on here. One, you have just the cognition, the cognitive, the, the conscious sort of intellectual, as you might call it, the, the cognitive of, of what you're saying, the void of emotion. Then you have the emotional content of what's going on, and you can either be conscious or unconscious of that. So you have either, you, you, you can have the conscious, cognitive consciousness, and you can have um, emotional consciousness. Um, and then you have things that are just deep in the unconscious that, that they don't have access to that are still going on, both emotional and at the cognitive level. And so what I think that is lacking and what causes a lot of these, um, so of these psychiatric phenomena is that there's a lack of integration between the, these, all these things that are hidden in the unconscious. So in therapy, when you're bringing certain things to conscious awareness, somehow it's helping to reintegrate these memories or emotions or thoughts um, into a cohesive, a conscious experience, then people can deal with them, perhaps in a, maybe outside of therapy, it would be too anxiety provoking for them to think about them consciously in order to reintegrate them into their into a cohesive um, conscious experience. In therapy, perhaps it's a safe environment or the way in which you bring about these, these repressed emotions or anxieties, it's safe for them to come up into awareness and then reintegrate it. So I think there's something to do with the fact that when you're bringing these, these hidden memories or emotions into conscious awareness, that it works to reintegrate them um, and then they can process them sufficiently in order to not have them constantly be affecting their behavior, being left in this sort of compartmentalized area where they can affect behavior and they don't have access to them and they don't have access to kind of help mold and remodulate and change that. So if you have some memory that's just stuck there and it's affecting your behavior, you can't even work through it somehow, I think you might need consciousness for that. So that in this protected environment in therapy, they must allow themselves to put down their defenses. They come there specifically and it's an active, active will. I'm going to go to the therapist and I want something to happen. So it can even be an unconscious letting down of defenses, but they allow these anxiety-provoking thoughts, emotions to come to awareness. They can re-modify them in a way that might be acceptable to consciousness. But at the neural level, I think it's a somehow a reintegration where there was a compartmentalizing, and somehow this therapeutic process is allowing it to reintegrate into the neural networks in a way that can then be modulated, and maybe they can re-remember the memory in a different kind of way that's more acceptable and less anxiety-provoking. But when it's just stuck out there in the, on the unconscious and it's a separate kind of little node, if you want to call it, there's no way to even rework it or remold it. It just keeps having this sort of negative effect. Whereas you know the consciousness somehow brings it into awareness and, and can reintegrate it in a new and maybe more adaptive way. I'm wondering, Eric, do you have anything you want to say on that topic too? Or you can just you can get the mic on the, the table if you want. So yeah, I think that's a great question, um, and in preparing my discussion point, I was wondering some of these same, same things myself, because um, in particular in terms of the way I think, which is kind of a, from an object relations perspective, and we think of a particular personality organization, some that are more neurotic, where the, um, the nature of the problem is more circumscribed usually, where most aspects of the person's life are relatively okay, but they have a particular area of difficulty that is related to some you know, focal conflict and psych the psychoanalytic situation is set up to try to, to uh, uh, bring that into awareness, mostly through verbal, verbal channels, um, picking up 
parapraxis, looked at the tongue, looking at dreams, th those kinds of things. With more borderline patients who, and those are more repressive style defenses usually that you're working with there. And borderline, you're working more with these kind of dissociative style defenses. And, and um, those are, the way I think of those, if you want to use that symphony metaphor, it's almost like there's two symphonies playing in, in some sense, and they're, and they're discordant. But the person's not aware of it. They're, when they're in, listening to one, they're not hearing the other, and vice versa. Whereas in the neurotic, it's more, it's kind of one, one coherent symphony, but there's a there's a section that's a little bit off. If you want to think of it that way, and so you're trying to draw attention to that one section. Um, so with the with the more borderline organized patient, the task is, a, is a, it shifts because what you're trying to bring into awareness is different, and it comes out in different ways. So in borderline patients, it's, it's not often through verbal channels that you're picking up contradictions and, and, and problems and discordances, it's through nonverbal channels or through behavior where they're doing things outside the session or they're, they're, you know, they're skipping sessions or they're you know, calling you between sessions. You know, all these things that are much more action-oriented and, um, and nonverbal. And so what you often are doing, particularly at the beginning, is helping to bring their awareness to their non the way they're nonverbally expressing these different you know, symphony, you know, expressions of symphonies through different channels. So, I don't know if that helps answer the question, but I think actually this is an area where psychoanalysis could contribute a little bit to neuroscience, where I think neuroscientists don't really usually think in terms of personality organization. They just kind of bring people in and give them a stimuli and don't take into account the relative maturity of the defensive organization of that person when looking at how they respond to stimuli, which might be pretty important. Thank you. To go back to the picture with the subliminal text and text that you showed us with the work sex. Hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to go back to the picture with the subliminal text that you showed us with the work sex. So I, I noticed that when you, even when you brought it to our awareness that there is something there, we still couldn't see it uh, until you pointed it out to us. Uh, so I was wondering if the uh, unconsciousness doesn't only serve as some kind of storage to things that we're not aware of, but there are cognitive processes that are going on that allow that to happen, and maybe the consciousness serves as some kind of an inhibition to the processes that we, we don't see. And uh, in that context, I also wanted to ask if you presented that picture to people, say, with the autism, would they see that and be aware of that? I mean, autism is really interesting, and also, I mean, all these other disorders like this, where, for instance, autistic patients, we test, don't, um, as part of our lab, also, it's a big lab in autism research, and which we're going to talk about, but they don't look at the eyes, let's say. They don't, most of the healthy people, they look at a face, will spend most of the time looking at eyes, and that's where you get social information from. The autistic patients don't really look at the eyes, but then we give them oxytocin, which is this social enhancing drug, which is sort of the bonding hormone, um, or which is released when a mother is milking or during sex, and then they spend more time looking at the eyes, um, and then I guess from that get more social cues and can better interact with people. Um, Prosopagnosics who can't recognize faces also they look at just the the deep the, the stimuli get in they see the face they see the eyes they see the nose, they just don't process it the percept of a face. So you have all these strange sorts of disorders where you have these dissociative, which are not, I wouldn't use the word dissociative, but well, dissociations between the stimuli coming in and their percepts. But I think the key here, especially with the subliminal studies as well, is attention. So it was always thought that consciousness and attention can be equated. But now new um, studies and research is showing that they're actually two different phenomena. Attention can work to enhance consciousness, so in a sense, if you think about these neural coalitions, these coalitions of neurons that are coming into awareness, attention can enhance it and keep it up there for longer. Um, but you can have consciousness without attention and vice versa. Uh, I, and if you're interested in this, there, there's a study, a review article by Christoph Koch and his student now, um, and his last name is Japanese name, it's very hard for me to remember. But if you look up a work by Christoph Koch and on attention versus consciousness, you can separate out the two. So when you have these stim stimuli, I tell you there's something there, and you might really be attending what's there, you know, but you're somehow not conscious of it. Now, the interesting thing is once the consciousness, the neural network for what's there, becomes aware of it, it's very hard not to see it. So now whenever I look at that image, I mean, it's right there, I can see it. So it's almost like that neural network for seeing the word, let's say, sex in the background is now there, and now whenever I see it, the stimuli comes in, and I, that neural network is activated, and I can't not see it. 
But it's, it's important to remember there's a difference between attending, between attention and what you're consciously aware of. And there's a lot of interesting studies in the lab that can manipulate these two things. Oh, it was very good. I, uh, this is a follow-up question on the Benjamin Libet. Um, to me, with the subliminal, there's a clear, there's a clear case when we are unconscious because we don't remember anything, and it's obviously an unconscious motivation. But with the Libet experiment, uh, experiment where the clock is going around and the, and the patient gives a subjective report of when they have the impulse to see, they first notice they want to stop the, uh, the hand moving around. I don't quite understand uh, why that couldn't be what you're saying now, a dim, a dim, faint consciousness without attention. In other words, how does Libet determine that the time when you ask uh, the patient when they had the impulse to stop the clock, that it took them to make up their mind, uh, was not identical to when the brain began registering those faint milli so-called milliseconds out of conscious. Maybe, in other words, the, the subject was aware of, of uh, exactly at the moment that the brain began showing, in other words, the activity. But they couldn't verbally report but it. But they, it, it took time to verbally report it. Is there an independent measure that shows that they were aware when the brain was showing, that there was consciousness, but they weren't aware of that consciousness? So what, to get away from the verbal report of it, it's to say, um, you don't just say, when, okay, now i decided. It's remember where that, that clock is when you do so you need a verbal report. They just have to go back and say, okay, the clock was at that point. So it's not even, because it does take time right, to make a verbal report, and in that time it could be that they were aware, and then they had to do the processes to then make the words, the form, to say, okay, I make the decision. Well, why couldn't the recollection of the, ver of the, uh, of the, the visual record. recollection, that the time that it takes them to identify in the consciousness where that was, visual numbers to recollect it. Right. It takes they're losing some time that they really had a recollection of it prior to when they could identify the memory. It's just that they can't connect it at the same time. But at the moment that the millisecond, the, uh, the brain was recording the potential that Libet sees, their consciousness was picking it up, but they can't, in, in recollection, uh, accurately. They, they, they miss five, they overlap it. Right? There's a lot of, it's, it's very fuzzy. There's a lot of um, controversy around these Libet studies that were done back in the 1960s. And I agree with you on some of these. It's very hard to predict the exact moment of when they were actually aware. In retrospect, it might have moved slightly. Um, but more recent studies, um, like those that came out of John Dylan Haynes' lab in, in Berlin, it's at the, the Charité and Humboldt University, uh, they do neuroimaging. And what they do is they backtrack. So they, they're doing neuroimaging, they say, press the left or the right button whenever you know you want. And then they don't, and then they're blind to what the person pressed, okay? Then they analyze the imaging data. And based on what the neural activity is, they can predict up to 10 seconds before the person actually made the choice, what they were going to choose, left or right. So that is getting really very, um, yeah, it, it explicit. But it's, I mean, what we, the technology we have right now, we can start getting from just these correlations to causation. We can go in the brain, can manipulate areas, and then see when the person becomes consciously aware of it. Or they, we can manipulate people to feel like they have an urge to do something, or they're going to make a decision. There's a lot of ways you can get much more precise now. The living studies, I agree, there's a lot of arguments against them. And there's very, the whole literature controversy around them. But since then, there's been subsequent studies. There are other studies which came out of, at Columbia. Hakuan Lao um, has done work where they have to go back and recollect, and then can do TMS, which is a transcranial magnetic stimulation, which can sort of interfere with neural networks, and he can backtrack where the person feels as if they had the intent, based on sort of, in a way, messing up the brain for a second, and then the feeling where they felt they had the intent to do the action, he can manipulate it in time, based on this transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's really interesting work. And there's a lot of work by, by Patrick Haygard in London also, which is looking at um, volition and movement and this um, dissociation between when the person actually feels as if they are going to do something and what, then the actual brain activity. So there's other evidence outside of the Libet studies which are still backing up this idea that the brain is sort of, whether it be seconds or milliseconds before the actual awareness takes place. Okay, and we'll have one last question. Hi, thank you very much. I have a quick follow-up question about the um, attention versus consciousness. And I'm wondering if it translates at all into ADHD. If, if, if one shifts attention to a new thing but can't sum it up 
consciousness to match it, that if you actually could do that, that would it be a easier to stay to keep your attention on Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I mean, at, at that level, getting to disorders like ADHD, I don't know that the distinction between consciousness and attention is going to do much in terms of like therapy and whatnot. I don't know at this point. I mean, now it's much more at an experimental level. Like we can come up with interesting paradigms where we can manipulate consciousness and awareness. And I don't know that we're at the point where we can then translate what we're understanding in the lab to things like ADHD, which there's a lot involved as well as you know the hyperactivity aspect of it and and. I'm not sure that what we know right now is going to be beneficial to treating those kinds of disorders, at least not yet. So let me just make two uh, brief announcements before we close. So our next meeting is not the first Sunday of the month, because it's either Easter or the Sunday before Easter. So our Saturday. Saturday. Saturday, sorry. Yeah, so uh, our next meeting is Saturday, April 10th, and we're going to have two uh, clinicians from the NPAP Clinical Neuropsychoanalysis Center, uh, Alice Enton and Ideen Newman, who are going to be presenting their work, uh, working analytically with uh, some brain damage patients. So that should be extremely interesting. Um, and also, uh, if you want to get announcements about future neuropsychoanalysis events, be sure to sign up on the sign-up list downstairs in the lobby. And finally, thank, uh, help me thank our speaker and our discussant for a fabulous <laughs>